so what what was um, what his ideas were? You want to? Yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, uh, what slides do you actually have there? So he made the slides. I've never seen them before, so it gets a little bit tricky. Can I just go through this? And then the next slide is with, yeah. Okay. Um, so um, I don't know how many of you have actually seen my talk at uh, LinuxCon in uh, Barcelona last year. Uh, some of you have. I think uh, Jake did a really nice, uh, or I think it was either Jake or John did a really nice write up on LWN on it. Go online and find it. That should be publicly for you, everybody now. So we did have a couple of issues in actually getting networking uh, on systems that are either highly embedded or have special use cases in automotive. Um, and they feed down also to something where we need this in the uh, enterprise world and uh, where we need this in, in some other things. But in mostly the embedded and automotive world was special in so many areas where we have things that the Linux kernel is really not helping us right now in where we want to go. Um, so enterprise has some interesting aspects and we will see more we're coming up with software defined networks and all this other stuff going in. But this is really not the area we wanted to go in. It was more of the areas, okay, what we needed for the uh, networks to actually change on a more dynamic basis. You drive off with your car, you lose your Wi-Fi connection to your home and well, you might think this is silly but people actually wanted to get the car to home and then it connects to your Wi-Fi network, syncs your music library and gets your updates or whatever. And then you drive off and then your network connection is gone. It's more like, okay, this is really a huge cell phone where you basically walk out of the door and then all of a sudden you have to figure out where you go. This means, okay, what are you going to do? 3G, 4G, get this backup done. Then you have the automotive cases where you actually have uh, uh, them the cars talking back to your backends and uh, getting a real-time data or just doing updated, doing service calls. And one of the famous ones was the uh, regulation that's coming in for 911 calls, where you have to provide extra data over the data network to the uh, uh, emergency operator to actually give you some help. Simple things are just sending the GPS coordinates or something. Um, other companies that build cars, especially the electric cars, uh, that get really popular also in the US and somewhere else, they have real-time telematics to talk back to home to actually get you updates, uh, optimize your battery so you can actually drive longer with your car and so on and so forth. And basically, I think in the future, all of them will be connected. And we are facing unique challenges there where we don't really uh, know where we're going. And um, this is if you let someone else do your slides, then nothing works. I hate this if this comes step by step. Let's do them, put them. Um, so one of the things is like, what do you always need to know if you're actually online or not? And believe it or not, even if you just have a perfect 3G connection, you drive in a different country, then you end up, okay, I switch to a different country, and then you lose your connection for a few times. But you're doing X amount of tasks, and then you have to deal with, okay, when I'm actually really back online. This is, we have this mostly figured out and works really nice. Same problem has cell phones where you basically switch from one access point to another one. So we solved it for the cell phone and we couldn't easily take this over to the car. So that problem is actually rather nicely solved in a way. Uh, uh, it actually worked out. The biggest problems that we had when it actually came to the things where we needed support from the, from the Linux kernel in getting this information out there when it comes to statistics or who used what or how much you're going to use or if you or hold for this month you used too much because hmm, my data contract is paid by the car company. They, they charge me 100 bucks for it per month for extra services, but they don't want me to overuse it to download videos over the internet uh, while I'm driving in a foreign country and paying a high bill. So it's like, okay, so we have to figure out what get actually got used. Uh, and that becomes like a really harder problem in actually getting this done right um, without being like wasting time, uh, but also being trying to figure out what is what network. So are you actually roaming, are you not roaming? Uh, is this your home Wi-Fi network? Nobody cares. Is this maybe a hotspot that you drove by and just paid with iPass, Boingo, or whatever? Do we have to apply a different billing cycle? Do we have different policies on this one? And so on and so forth. Um, we have put, or oh, actually, I have to give this back to Daniel. He has done most of the work on this one. Um, we actually have been using uh, NetFilter accounting for this one and have, uh, and uh, I'm going with this one anyway, since it's not my slides, I'm just running free now. Um, so we have done net filter accounting for this one, and we got in a really good shape in actually getting most of the statistics sorted out in a way where we know, okay, this Wi-Fi network used X amount, this one, this one used X amount of data, uh, this was why we are roaming, this was why we are not roaming, and so you can go actually back in time and see, okay, what have we been using? Um, 
which really helps us then to actually get further. At the same time, this is also applies to cell phones where you just want to have some user statistics and even goes back, you want to use this on the desktop. The one thing where it gets then really interesting is when you have uh, special uh, routing for your application. Say application A wants to go to the corporate network and application B wants to go somewhere on the public internet. Um, and while most people think this is a unique problem for VPN users and corporate desktops and things like that, it actually is more widespread that you have dedicated applications in the automotive where you want, okay, this is the application that the car manufacturer puts into the car. They pay for the SIM card, but there's only this one application that's allowed to go over the SIM card that they supply you with the car. Um, and it's actually not trivial to solve that problem if you want to make sure that it's only this application and this application only. It starts with the simple fact, okay, which process actually belongs to this application? If you have uh, threaded processes, if you have both that spawn other processes, can they actually uh, break out of this one? Can they actually uh, then basically use the car manufacturer SIM card to actually get uh, the data connection out there? Uh, if they get into your back end, if this is like a private uh, 3G network, can they do some malicious work, et cetera? So we have done a lot of work on getting this one done, and I have to give the hand also back to Daniel on this one, doing the job for this one. But we actually have a lot of stuff that's working. It doesn't work completely perfectly as we like to, but we already have a lot of stuff uh, working on this one. So you want to do the explanation how this works? Yeah, sure. Excellent. Thanks. Okay. Um, so one first problem we, we face is, as Marcel said, um, which resource belongs to an application? Um, last year I was discussing that at LPC and uh, my proposal was to go with, with um, C groups because it was kind of sexy idea to have C groups for that. So basically, um, knowing the resources in the kernel space belong to which application. That's what C groups helps you to do. The um, idea was not, not really, um, ex was not really good time to talk about new features for C groups um, for several reasons. I don't know, go in that details. So well, for, then the next thing we said, okay, we need to identify the application somehow and best thing is to do since um, we expose and for Conman um, the APIs via Dbus, so it talks, any application talks us with us via Dbus, we need to identify the application via Dbus. Um, Dbus gives you, um, in, prin in principle, those ways to identify. So you can ask, okay, which UID belongs this message I got to? You can ask which GID, or you basically get it from via UID, you can ask which GID. And finally, um, SE Linux support is in, in, the current, uh, in the DBus. So you can ask, okay, which uh, context, security context, this message belongs to. Um, for example, um, Android solved, they have, they have, they solved a different way, exactly this problem to do statistics per application. What they did basically is, first of all, they install every application with its own UID. Obviously, um, they kind of, uh, abusing is the wrong word, but just they're using UIDs to, to uh, identify the application. That means you can't have multi-user support anymore. They just use that for the applications. So that's why probably uh, it's still uh, multi-user support for Android devices is, I don't know how far they are currently, but they're just struggling, I figure. Um, f another interesting thing is obviously you can start an application more than once and running with one UID, you, cannot, you cannot really distinguish between the applications. So, um, so group, GID and UID basically are kind of grouping together. So SE Linux in that context is a very interesting stuff because you can actually uh, have the, the same application start in different contexts and giving different um, identifier. So it's possible basically to say, okay, an application with um, with different uh, starting several times, and that's um, for. Our use cases we do with uh, starting twice two different browser instances. One is going to our to our um, our, our built-in SIM card to the, uh, to our network, and the other is just a normal browser in the car. And uh, so we have running 
twice the instance, and so UID and GID wouldn't really work. I mean, unless you would start the application again in different things. But um, obviously, there are different, some more LSM uh, module uh, methods there, like your, um, what uh, what it called. Um, yeah, so. I don't know who uh, followed the discussion on the DBus mailing list about LSM support for different things. It, so the, uh, it was rejected mostly out of the reason because uh, it's very hard to maintain. Several uh, implementation for the LSM and the term used was Frankenstein bus. It shouldn't turn into something like that. Uh, so the current situation with the DBus implementation is, um, yeah. We just have SE Linux upstream. Um, I hope that situation will change with KDBus if it happens. But uh, Kai and Leonard are not here, right? Unfortunately. <laughs> so, um, so now with um, the it, now we know how to identify the application. We still have to associate um, the resources in that case. For C group and uh, for CPU and memory management, you can do uh, it via C groups. That that works. For networking, um, there are two C group controllers um, there, but those are more marking. They're just marking packets. Um, yeah. Well, this is this is um, this is just one piece of the problem you have to solve. You have to mark the packets which belong to which application. And so what, what we've then done is now we're using IP tables and NF Act to, um, to do the accounting and also the routing. And so the trick here is um, we have one applic per application one, uh, one IP table rules, or the IP table rules for one application is that um, the owner match is used, so I'm just saying, okay, if I know the, u, uh, the user, in this case, this is the identifier uh, from the DBus, I know, it's, for example, it's uh, my owner, uh, the UID 1234, and I can set the mark, so every, every packet generate or is sent out or processed, this may be the better word, gets this marker, and this marker will then uh, be used later for um, accounting, and this is the second, the third line. The, um, we're using here the NF Act module for this. Um, obviously, you can see um, per application, free rules is, it's not cheap. Um, also, um, we need obviously global rules. These are for restoring the marker. So for outgoing packets, it's trivial, you know, it's, you know from which application the packets are coming, but when they're coming back, you have to restore this marker. Obviously, you can just use this uh, connection marker uh, uh, module. That works for TCP very well. UDP is kind of tricky. Um, and obviously, in the, uh, this is our for, just for the accounting and for the routing, which is installing um, policy routing tables. That means, um, Instead, the normal default routing table, we will always use the policy routing table, also using the, the same marker um, set. So this is what, how you can do it, but uh, I'm not completely happy with it, because you can see it's pretty much a lot of things you have to do, and we have to play a bit around to see how it performs. And uh, I also looked at how Android does it. Um, so they avoided this part. Instead, they're using two IP tables modules. One is, is um, called Quota2. It's maintained upstream as add-on package. So this is basically no problem. Um, and the other one is a completely self-developed uh, IP tables module. Um, So um, I've 
I, I don't know if you can read it, but um, so this is the IP tables I put on an Android phone, a current one. So this is the table as it looks, right? You see the input chain, the forward chain, and the output chain, so the normal chains for the filter table. And they have um, a target a back, background and foreground, so they, um, they can distinguish for an application if this socket is used as foreground traffic, for foreground traffic and for they have sockets for background traffic. This is, I mean, you probably have seen the statistics uh, menu. And this is basically what they have installed. And here in the, somewhere here you see the, uh, here's the quota module, the, the standard one. And later on you see these um, user-defined um, chains do not have any rules in there. That's the second module you don't see. It's the... Okay. So, okay. So this um, second module is called X, uh, XT QTAG UID. So this module is sitting in the IP tables domain and does a lot of things. Um, so the first thing you notice is that, okay, the first line, um, you see the uh, different um, fields, so you have an identifier for the line, and then you have the interface name, where it's, it's basically um, accounting for, and then you have uh, an, a tag, oh, you see, you don't see it, it's a bit lower. So it, these are the sockets basically opened by the application. So these, all those um, lines are one socket. Each of them is a socket, and each socket gets its own tag. And this tag is um, then reported via the quota module. And you can see here, for example, these, have, these uh, tags have all, have all a meaning, like, like the first bit means it's foreground, and the second bit, yeah, so. Anyway, um, so this is how Google does that. And we uh, discussed that upstream, and. And Pablo was not really in favor of, of having this thing, so we went the other way with the NF Act module. Um, coming back to that. This is... Okay, the question is uh, how do you create that log uh, if this is a custom module? Yes, it's com completely custom module. Uh, you access this information via the sys file system. You just um, go in there and you, get, you, you pull basically that information from, uh, from the kernel. And one thing I, I really like to avoid is to ask the kernel for updates. This is, this is not really good for power saving if you have to pull the information and, and it probably gets a bit difficult, more difficult if you go into the um, um, region where you say, okay, up to two megabytes and then stop this connection. So you need like a complex policy to pull, hey, give me this information. So they, they, they um, manage the application user space. So they have, uh, the quota module also allows you to set the limit to, um, to one of those tags. You can say, okay, this tag um, is allowed to use so much and then it's blocked. So this is the uh, feature of quota module. Okay, so, so the, what we're trying to do now currently to improve the situation is um, the owner match um, currently allows you for outgoing packets to be matched on, on, on uh, to whom it belongs and uh, recently the Routing table, the no, routing cache was removed from the TCP, uh, from the networking stack, and this allows now to um, do the same thing for inco so you can basically match on for incoming packets um, without using this connection tracker. And for for TCP, it is a one-liner. Um, it's it's it should be already sent to the mailing list. For UDP. 
um, there's some more work to do. Um, we, um, basically, it needs a new hook in the NF, um, NF or the net filter infrastructure for early DMOX. I think it's that, there's a place where you could do that, but um, I'm not really happy with it because it's just for TCP, UDP, then there are different protocols as well. It would be nice to have something more generic at that, at that place that you can just say traffic going to that socket account, basically, or, uh, or you can install an IP tables rule for this. So this is kind of a wish for the kernel developers to, to help out there or tell us at least how we do have to do this. No one here from. <laughs> um, then, as I said, um, the owner matcher doesn't support LSM, so you can't say which context. But that's also this is this is trivial to fix. For um, NF Act, as I said, it's um, currently it's we have to pull from user space for for getting the statistic from the kernel. Um, this is for power saving reasons not so cool. And um, we're, we're trying now to figure out how to do it that more and more, yeah, kind of installing an IP tables rule where you can say after that much time or um, byte transfer, just notify user space. Something like that would be very cool. And it's, it's not really f figured out how to do that, but I think this will be the next step. So, yeah, this is just uh, how it we have done that for Conman, but obviously all the stuff we're doing from the kernel side can also be easily implemented from any other different networking manager. So it doesn't, we do not do any special things there, right? Questions? Yeah, please. Yeah, because it's recording. Yeah. yeah, so just going back to the uh, original uh, user ID match you did on the IP tables. Um, so that's the UID of the process sending the packet. But you mentioned uh, using DBus to identify the UID. I didn't understand the connection. Yeah, okay. The DBus, uh, so the application basically notifies uh, Conman via DBus. It wants to do um, a session. The session is the, the terminology we use to to identify the application. Uh, maybe I should really go to that slide. Wait. Yeah. Let, let, let me. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So. Okay. This is how um, we have done that. So we have Conman running here normally, and then you have the application individually, and they talk to Conman via DBus, and they create a session object on the DBus, and and uh, the notify object basically is just for the callbacks, but you can ignore that in that discussion. So this is how the application tells us I want to be connect, I want online connectivity, and what we can do is also configure this session according some database or some rules we have, like this application is allowed to use uh, wireless and the other one is allowed to use a 3G connection. Exactly. So, yeah, so the question is um, where setting up the titles. So this is now, I know the application and now in kernel I tell, okay, for that application all the traffic generated is owned by that application. So this is the connections, yeah. Oh, sure. Um, so you, you, you talked about the uh, DBus LSM hooks and the mess that we're in with KDBus and and DBus LSM, and we're we're going to make a try it again to sort of unify unify both the LSM hooks within DBus and sort of and unify the mechanism between uh, KDBus and DBus. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> so um, yeah, we just we currently um, get not involved with that discussion, but we're saying this is something we would probably need. It would be very nice to have a way to identify application via DBus. Very simple. That's that's a key feature for us. Anything? Yeah. Okay. So 
we are not there where we really want to be. So the general goal is a little bit goes a little bit broader. Um, for every you, it is a little bit uh, has a little bit of knowledge about how system is managing uh, services and also system he wants to manage applications in the future. They will uh, TJ and Kai Leonard. They all working together. That the kernel gets a single hierarchy uh, C group. That system we manage this is C group, and at that point you actually do have services, uh, applications, user space applications, even up to the level like Firefox, for example, bound to a specific C group. At that point, the kernel has a really good knowledge about which process belongs to which uh, C group, which means which resources belong to which process. Um, with that one in mind, if we would have that at some near future, maybe next year if we're lucky, um, we can identify everything uniquely and really assign statistics, uh, policies, and everything to it. The problem is what we are running then into when that happens is that we can't set any markers on C group IDs or anything right now in NetFilter. We have the problem, as you identified, we need to update the tables dynamically, which uh, IP tables interface right now is inherent static. And the replacement, which is called NF tables, is on the process in getting upstream. Uh, at the last NetFilter workshop, they have tentatively agreed that this is the way forward, where you actually can then dynamically uh, and atomically update the tables. Um, that's something in progress. It hasn't happened yet, so that needs to happen also first. Uh, and then we might get at some point in the position that we actually have ap applications uniquely identified, so the resources can be actually tracked and also limited at the same time, because what we can do then, what Google is doing in Android with essentially hack to the net filter, where we say, okay, your application just have to consume too much data, you're just done for this month until a user says, oh, I'm accepting the responsibility, now it costs me extra costs, so I'm going further. Um, but if you can't update the uh, IP tables or the net filter rules dynamically, you basically uh, have the chance that you block yourself out if someone else is actually messing with the tables. Um, so these things are happening, and they will be happening, and this is the way we are going forward with this one, that we actually have the capabilities of putting the uh, net filler tables in, being able to use C groups to identify the applications. And at that point, we luckily hopefully get then incoming and outgoing socket traffic properly accounted for, and then you get memory limits with it, resource limits for networking, et cetera. That's where this is uh, going eventually. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. Um, I was asked that someone would take notes. If, if Is someone willing to take notes for the session? If not, I'm going to do it. Just Okay. Um, if there's not more, then let's move on to the next um, part, which is the um, device management in automotive. Um, okay. I'm going to take notes. 